Hello there and welcome to the video. In this video we will look at a game by a player you might not have heard about but he was one of the strongest players in the world. I'm talking about Leonid Stein. Now Leonid Stein, he, well, he died tragically at the age of 38. But he had great chess accomplishments. Among his accomplishments was winning the Soviet Chess Championship three times in 19 uh yeah between 1963 and 1966 in four attempts he won three soviet championships he also won very strong tournaments in moscow in 1967 and 1971 and he was very close to uh, qualifying for the candidates the only thing holding uh, holding him back was that back in the day there was a rule that you could not have more than three players from the same country so the Soviet Union obviously was dominating the chess world. So that was the only reason that Stein did not make the candidates. But he was a very, very strong player and very respected. And the words that uh, Gary Kasparov wrote about him in his book series, My Great Predecessors is, well, have a look at this. Stein, he went beyond the bounds of Botvinnik Smyslov harmony, expanding the limits of our understanding of the game, changing our impressions of the correlation of material and quality of position, of situations with disrupted material and strategic balance, and created the grounds for the emergence of modern ultra dynamic chests. That's what Gary wrote. Those are quite the words, and he meant them. And as an example of Leonid Stahl's great style, we are going to look at this game from 1972. Uh, 1972, of course, was the year that Fischer and Spassky played in Reykjavik, the legendary match. And this game was also played in Reykjavik in 1972. And Stein's opponent was Guðmundur Sigurjónsson, uh, the second ever Icelandic Grandmaster. Very strong Grandmaster indeed very solid and uh, he was the assistant of uh, Robert Hubner uh, for a period of time so a very well respected grandmaster just to give you a little bit of context but let's see the game so we're gonna look at it from the black side uh, because Stein had the black pieces and we have the Sicilian e4 c5 it looks like we're going to have a knight off, but there is knight c3 first by uh, Guðmundur, Sjönnason, a6, and now we transpose back into the knight or formation. Guðmundur plays a rare line here, f4. Rare but sharp, but I think these days it, it's com considered quite harmless, and I like the way that Stein handles this. He plays knight b to d7, knight f3, e6. And with the bishop d3, he uh, hits the bishop with knight c5. So this is an aggressive setup for white. Uh, usually he doesn't mind black taking here if he gets, you know, take with a pawn and gets an attacking setup with, uh, you know, castles and queen to h4. But that doesn't always happen. So white castles, bishop b7 by black, a4 now by uh, white, castles, King h1, usually a good preparatory move, just get out of any tactics on, on this diagonal. And Stein just sets up a hedgehog type position with black, plays b6, and white plays very aggressively here with b4. Stein takes, and we have bishop to b7. Queen b3, and rook c8, very logical play by black. He now has the bishop pair. He's dreaming of opening up the diagonal for the bishop, but that might not be all that easy. White played bishop e3. Turns out this might be a mistake. Now, here, Stein comes up with just an amazing, brilliant concept, ending in a truly brilliant move. That's really difficult to find. But here, he played the move, pawn to d5. Now, of course, if white were to take, that would be just super fantastic. We would open up for the bishop, we would have trades, 
and this bishop is an absolute monster. This would be a dream scenario for white. Sorry for black. So of course white doesn't take, so he plays e5. And here we have to ask ourselves, what is Stein thinking? Because if we uh, now move the knight, it could go here or here. Either way, the knight jumps into d4, and white has this lovely blockading square. And we can't really uh, allow this blockade because it's too strong. We can uh, play another move to uh, secure the blockade, and then white can build up and slowly, after uh, you know bringing the rook into the game and realigning his pieces, he, he can go for an attack on the king's side, f5 at some stage when, when this is secure. And meanwhile, black has no real counterplay. I mean, nothing happens on the c-file. Everything's covered, a5, then b5, b5, then a5. So, uh, and increasing the pressure from b4 is almost impossible. So this blockade would give white a uh, tremendous positional advantage. So just based on, the, based on that, it seems that uh, black should sacrifice at least the pawn on, on d5 and play d4. You know, just to avoid the blockade. And that's what black does. But he did not have in mind just to sacrifice the pawn to open off of the bishop. He had much more devious plans, and we're about to see that. In the game, Grimmett took with the knight on d4. That takes d4. Now, if he were to take with the bishop, then we take an f3. And this undermines this guy. And even though we can take here, uh, this is actually a strong position for black. Bishop hangs, we can give it up here, but I mean, the computer gives a huge advantage to black after this. G takes f3 and rook fd8. Even though the pawns are about equal, we're about to capture this. This is hanging. It's a great position for black. So, Quimit went with knight takes d4. And again, doesn't look like much. Okay, knight g4. Hitting the bishop, we have to keep an eye on the knight on d4. But here comes the brilliant move, seemingly out of nowhere. So black sacrificed the pawn. So what did he have in mind? Did he want, just want to open up for the bishop? The bishop is strong. Don't get me wrong, it's fantastic. But he had a super tactic up his sleeve. I pause the video and try to find it. And if you can, kudos. I'm not going to show you, and this is <laughs> just an amazing move, and I don't think anybody would think of this move unless it was a, it was a tactical puzzle or, or if I told you there's an amazing move. But Stein played knight takes h2, <laughs> like what? Now first of all, if we take with the bishop, we take on d4, and we win a bunch of stuff. This is hanging, this is hanging, this is hanging. We're going to win a bunch of stuff for black. So what are our choices? In the game, white played actually rook after c1. But why can't we just take with the king? King takes h2 and keep this. Well, black has two very good choices. He could take on c3 or take on b4 immediately. In both cases, the idea is that he can't take on b4 because of this very nasty mate with queen to h4. So after this, black actually win back, uh, wins back a lot of material. He's going to take on c3, d4 will hang, d3 will hang. Monster, monster bishop, you know. We win back material and there is a positional uh, superiority. So this move uh, gives black a tremendous position. So uh, Gwimmeter avoided the uh, checkmate, played rook after c1. Knight came back to g4. Knight to e4. And again, renewing the threat of uh, mate here. White didn't really have, have have a good choice. His idea was to get the knight here to g5 to block. But here, I guess uh, Stein wanted to avoid unnecessary complications and play queen d5, which more or less forces a queen trade. He could have taken on c1 and played bishop d2, starting to pick up stuff. But maybe he didn't want to uh, calculate tactics like this. You know, and black doesn't have to allow stuff like this. It, it's still good for black. 
but I think it's a good practical decision. Queen d5 will more or less force to trade eventually because of the threat. White blocked here, but now we just trade on b3. And black is up a pawn, he has the bishop here, and as you'll see, now he starts pushing the b pawn, he has a tremendous position. So probably a good uh, practical decision by Stein here. And he keeps pressing through with tactics. We have rook uh, to c4, g3, he first secures the knight, which seems useful, h5, creating Luft as well, which might be useful. King g2, rook to d8, going to the open file. And after rook c2, he once again uses tactics to simplify here. And actually win a pawn, he plays bishop takes e5, very nice. Now if you take on e5, the rook is hanging, so you don't really have a choice, but take on c4. And Guimund relaxes to move the knight. If he takes here, Blackly looks like he's fairly easily winning up two pawns. There are a lot of good moves, maybe check first, but just taking the pawn looks fine. Maybe checking and, and, uh, and then taking on e5. Check, let's see, check here. And then take on e5. Looks very good, up two pawns. So knight e5 was played, but now the rook comes in with check. Bishop d4, very nice tactics. And he is sort of, you know, playing along here with tactics. The pawn is hanging, right? But what if you take it? Knight h2, so many like sweet lines here. And this mates. So you have to do something first, have a bishop d4. So white took on d4 and First the check, and then we take on d4. So now white has to worry about winning back this pawn here. But actually he can't, and the pawn is rolling. c3, rook c1, rook comes into d2. So black is up two pawns, rook d3. Now the knight comes in, and Guimundre eventually resigned after knight to f5. A beautiful game by Leonard Stein, and indeed, he got the brilliant surprise at the tournament for this game, and deservedly so. I mean, knight takes h2, fantastic move, super fantastic move, like a move out of nowhere. This is, you know, this is, you know, what we love about chess. You know, moves that surprise us, brilliancy. I also liked uh, when you play bishop d4 later in the game here. You know, if you, if you take the pawn, we have the mate. And then the Swiss and Suk, you know, just overall uh, a truly brilliant game by, by Leonard Stein. And uh, again, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoyed that game. And I'll see you soon with another chess video. Bye-bye.